Hi, my name is Benedict for Higher Hertz. In this video, we're looking at UJAM's virtual bassists. Initially, I was setting out to look at one of them, but then UJAM went and sent over four of them. So I figured, look, seeing each has a slightly different sound, or radically, depending upon where you want to sit on this spectrum, then it, I might as well just drop them all in, and then you can have a little bit of an AB as well. We'll drop straight into hearing some of it. This is Dandy playing some sounds. Context. All right, that's what we're looking at. As you will see, once we get there, then I've got one, two, three, four, five of them to run through. But they're all essentially the same, so we don't look at five different products, merely be aware that they all sound a little different and have some differences in focus. There is a caveat that I must put at the beginning of this for all fairness and all honesty. I do have a grave concern with this style of product. Not UJAM, but this style of product across the whole industry. Uh, and I will discuss that in the section on uh, virtual players. If you don't want to watch that section, feel free to skip it, but do understand that my grave concern will color everything here. This is not a style of product that I own or want to own or want to use or feel like I'm missing anything out on for not having. Nonetheless, there are certain points of view. There are certain things that are put forward by the manufacturer to say this will do this. So I will look within the context of what they're presenting but also within the context of my point of view, which if you want to understand it better, please watch the section on virtual players uh, before raising any issues. So we've got these four bass players. This is the Royal, which is a softer, more polite, generally form of, I should imagine, maybe a precision bass. I don't know that they ever tell us what instruments he used, and nor does it really matter. This is a more classic clanky rock bass. I like the dandy probably the best of the lot. Mellow is a stand-up double bass, big bull fiddle. I tried to make each of these fit the piece. Rowdy is designed more for alternative type stuff and can vary tremendously. And then a slap, which I probably haven't got right, but I don't feel like I've actually worked out how to make it sound kind of thing. Put them into context. Now I'll work you through. This is the player side of the device where it plays itself, which is a major focus of the, the promises that are given and put into a what we loosely call a rockabilly piece. This is Royal. This is Dandy. The piece was written with Dandy. Both of the pieces that I show were written with Dandy, so in some ways it will fit a little bit better. Mellow, this is the big bull fiddle. Each has some things that work better and some things that don't work as well. Overall, I will be honest and say I don't feel like there's any single one that really nails what we're looking for. But 
Sadly, there is no rockabilly type programming in here at all. Now, that is really very, very common. There are very few um, VST anywhere that I've ever encountered that pay any real homage to rockabilly. Uh, it is a hard thing to do. So if you're listening to it going, oh, well, it doesn't sound right. No, it doesn't. It's really hard to do. Uh, you can do sort of a flat version a la Billy Idol or Zig Zig Sputnik. Um, but real rockabilly is hard to do. I think that works okay as a flat version if we had a good singer on top of it. That's the side of the bass that that they really push. This is the virtual player side where the device has a whole lot of patterns and phrases in it. You can trigger them and it will put together what we'll loosely call a performance. Now we'll have a look at UJAM and the pricing. Firstly, okay, UJAM are actually a fair size player in the business. You may not be super familiar with them, but UJAM actually sit under quite a few things, uh, a fair amount of um, some bits and pieces within reason environment are actually UJAM. UJAM's Gorilla Engine appears in quite a lot of places, but a lot of times you may not know this. Um, UJAM are uh, a fair size player in the space in which they work, but just aren't as well known as maybe even UVI or um, definitely native instruments and the contact thing. UJAM have decided to go down a particular path and you'll see that all the stuff I bring up here really pushes that. Make more music with less hassle. Designed to keep you in the zone. Amazing tracks. It's all about this promise of you'll get amazefulness with, well, not much effort. You see the same here. The bridge from your imagination directly to your computer as though there is no real technical understanding necessary. Technically... They are correct. The results that we've got here, I haven't pushed to get the most amazeful results. I've just gone as far as the average user would go. Um, has it really translated what was in my imagination to the computer? Well, I've already pointed out I don't really think so. Um, but nonetheless, this is their marketing. This is their promise. This is what I set out to investigate and to question. Answer, well, that's up to you. And then when we get to the, the, the suite, seeing they've sent over all of them, each one is $129. So each one of these devices is individual. You can buy them as a box, and I don't have access to the price. I'll see if I can remember to put it up. But you can have a look if you're interested. You'll be going and having a look in prices. may have changed by the time you see this anyway. But right now, each individual one of these is $129. US. Not exactly cheap, but not not badly priced either. The difference between each one is primarily the, the sound or playing feel and a little in the patterns that are inside. But again, there's very much this promise, lay down studio quality bass lines with ease. Uh, and then backed up by the get the bass wrong though and you're in trouble, which is using fear to make you feel like, well, this is the only way you're gonna be safe. Um, yeah, this is the time for me to discuss my concern, the, the difficulty which you will hear come through over and over in this. Virtual players, I know virtual players and AI this, that and the other are the most de thing in, well, a certain part of the, um, well, the online music space. I do not support that. Uh, I have never have, and nor do I believe I ever will. The problem is they're essentially loops. Now, these are MIDI playing back an actual player, so I'm not saying they're loops, but I'm saying essentially they are. And to suggest that we can get a true studio performance from these devices, especially that from my brain to my computer, that, that it can somehow know what I'm wanting to do and deliver it for me, is, this is again, you jam, well, they put it here, it is fundamentally flawed and straight out wrong. Again, this is my opinion, uh, but it's you're, you're not going to be able to separate that from my opinion on the rest of the devices. 
if you want a real bass player, you, re you bring in a real bass player. Let's, for example, pick on this fella called Leland Sklar. Leland Sklar is one of the most prolific studio players, played through the 70s with uh, Jackson Brown, uh, who was an absolute top name, second only to about the Eagles, uh, and then played with lots of other people, including Lucky Phil um, on the uh, No Jacket Required tour, so su su studio. Um, Lee's the bass player's bass player. The guy knows what he's doing. If I had Lee come in and I said, hey, Lee, I'm trying to get this kind of rockabilly feel with my drums here. He might say, oh, what keys it in or what are your changes or whatever. Fair enough, I show them to him, thank you. But he's going to know what I need. A, from experience, and B, because he's a real musician, he's got a real feel, but he's going to actually play to my piece. He's going to understand what my piece needs, and he's going to take that into account. He's going to push, he's going to pull, he's going to swing, he's going to change the length of his notes, he's going to do all kinds of stuff. He might slap, he might whatever it takes to make that work the way that I need it to work. And if I need a change, I'm going to say to him, Lee, I like where you're going, but you know what, can we make this bit a little bit more, or whatever. And once we understand each other, then he's going to go, I get you, Benedict, and, and I'm going to be like, you're the man, Leland. I know why I had to pay you a lot of money. That's a real studio player and a real studio interaction. I have done that with people in my studio, this very studio here. What you get as a result is way beyond this. So the suggestion... Um, unless it's severely tongue-in-cheek, that we're going to get anything resembling a player out of these boxes is, well, it's big Pinocchio nose, and I have that issue, and anyone chasing down that path, they might go, oh, but it gets me there. Fair enough. But it doesn't get you where an actual player would even an ordinary player. I've picked on one of the greatest names, but even an ordinary player, somebody who's passable, will probably give you a better result, unless, of course, they are completely clueless. But if you're bringing clueless people into your studio, you are probably clueless yourself. So please, take extreme care with this fantasy that this device or any device or any AI or any of that kind of stuff is actually going to be able to deliver you the equivalent of pulling in a remotely skilled, a remotely experienced person. The same goes with mixing. Any of these things that need to be done, they are an art form, an absolute art form. Now, if I got Leland Sklar in the play bass and like, yeah, winning, and then I said, hey, Pino, Pino Palladino, can you come over me place? Yeah, fella, comes over and goes, as Pino is prone to doing, I'm going to get something that might be similar, but it's going to be a very different take on the very same thing. This concept that there is one and it's the right way of doing it is really, well, it's what I think is killing music. And this isn't about old guy shouts a cloud. It's simply because having Leland in the studio and playing Leland Skla onto my music, telling my story with me, or having Pino Palladino doing the same thing delivers way more than any box of nuts and bolts can ever do. Now, there is another side to this device that it can actually be played as an instrument. So the same thing, you can pop over into instrument mode. It drops the patterns and then you play it yourself. And here's one we've prepared earlier. Royal. Dandy. Remember this was written with Dandy. Mellow, which is the bull fiddle. Let's put it in common. 
context. This is what I loosely refer to as art rock. So it's vaguely somewhere like prog, vaguely somewhere like pop. That can be anywhere from Bowie through um, Peter Gabriel, um, early Japan, any of that kind of stuff. And just for interest, in both cases, I used um, Goran Groove's handy drums. The mallets are the ones in this case. So that's Royal. Dandy. I find overall Dandy probably has the best drive. Mellow. Now that's actually programmed. That's as close as we can go to sort of saying, okay, here's me using the instrument as it sits. Again, probably possible to get slightly more detailed results, but I only want to go as far in these reviews as the average person is going to get. Um, yeah, the, the, the problem is they're a little limited. But so much of the focus here is on simplicity. So any instrument, any live played instrument, a guitar, a bass, a bass is not just a thing that goes dum 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 in time. A great bass is it's a real art form. A, a band with a good, really good bass player um, is far better than a band with a, a, a poor bass player and amazeful guitarists. You, if you have to pick between paying good money to get a great bass player or, um, or throwing lots of money at guitarists, always buy the best place player you can find because it's going to pull your band together far better than anything else. So if you can get a Leland Sklar, a Pino Palladino, a Guy Pratt, anyone like that, you spend the money uh, because they are worth more, actually, than a Stevie Vai. Sorry, Steve, but the reality is your bass player will pull things together. More importantly, you jam's right about that. You want to get it right, but you've got to get it right. Because if you don't get it right, if you don't have that feel, then people will just, well, they won't flow to it the way you want them to. So we'll have a look at the, the overall good and bad. Again, being very open to the fact that I have some serious reservations not about the products per se, but about this style of product across the board. Yes, in, uh, in raising their, their uh, promise to say that we will make this easy, yes, they are relatively simple, but it's relative. The less you know, the less goodness you're going to get from these. So if you come in really blind, you will get results and possibly be really impressed and pleased with yourself but you may be digging a hole that you don't realise. And, well, <laughs> that's, that's not a good thing. Uh, so, yes, they're relatively simple and relatively fast. Uh, that bit is correct. You can get a result. But, unfortunately, you can't control anything. They do sound okay. I don't think they're the best sounding bass libraries I've ever heard. There is something, I guess, sort of very 2010 about the sound of them. And for some people, they'll think, oh, that's amazing. They sound so... But for me, they sound like they lack versatility uh, because they only sound this way. They've got a certain sound built into them. They're working on the assumption that everybody's going to want to sound exactly that way. And that's okay if that's the sound you're chasing and that sound hasn't suddenly become passe for being yesterday's news. It doesn't mean you can't turn them to other things. See how there I warp them into giving me some kind of art rock. And if that were the right situation, I would go with that in one of my own records. Uh, but there is just something about the sound that makes me feel like they are very... 
preset in a lot of their sound, trying to make it so that they're easy or pre-mixed. And that's not how basses are. Basses are wild characters. Uh, and that's part of what makes a great performance, how somebody tames that wildness. So they're relatively simple and fast and they sound okay. They cover their essential promise, essentially. However, you really can't control the phrases. We will look at that in a mo, the phrases and everything like that. You really can't control them. They are just essentially preset things. Yes, you can run through variations and with this many little things to click. If we sat and did the math, we would find there were lots of variations, somewhat like buying um, 3,000 loops in a box. Uh, but the problem is each of those loops is just preset. Um, you can put them through some kind of a mangler, but you haven't actually changed the musicality, you haven't changed the playing, you haven't changed the articulation of that material. You've merely munged it. And there's a big difference between musicality and munging. Um, you have to decide what's important here. But the inability to control or access those phrases, like you can't export them, there is no way to drag the phrase setup that I've got here out into my device. Now, maybe there's going to be a version 2 or something like that, because these are a little long in the tooth, I think, because they're only showing VST 2.4, not showing VST 3. So maybe there's a new version that's going to give those features. I think there should be if they're going to continue to go down this path. But you have no access to modify this. Remember when I said if I have Leland Sklar in here playing bass for my, my Rockabilly Jam, uh, if I don't love a certain thing that he plays, I can say to him, Lee, um, that bit can you play that this way, go up that there, or play two notes instead of one here, and he's going to go, yep, yeah, okay. And But you can't do that here. There's no way to do that out of their patterns. So the fact that you really can't tell this what you want, you can only pick a pattern and press play on it, uh, is like a preset drum machine in that sense. Uh, and you can't pull out the performance that you have got and turn it into MIDI. So somewhere down the track, if these become not available for whatever reason, uh, and you have built a piece around it and not actually saved it to audio, or you're trying to access the MIDI of it, um, sorry, it's not going to happen. So please just be aware of that going into this. That That is a, a limit. They are okay. They do cover what they say they're going to do, and they're interesting, but you need to work out whether the good and bad of what's here and my massive overawing caveat of the virtual players are not a good idea puts them in a situation where I just wouldn't use them. I wouldn't pick them up and I wouldn't use them. Uh, but that is my personal opinion, and I'm just being honest to show where I stand on it because I can't help but have this color the whole review. I am not one of those guys who's just going to be like, go hit our affiliate link. I would not sleep at night if that were the case. Well, the first I encountered this style of, of, mach of machine uh, was actually through them. It was through Reason called A-List Guitarist, and I remember being like, and then getting it and being like, this just feels infuriating and at no point do I feel like I can get any of the feel of any record that I like coming out of this. Uh, again, it was a combo of that sound. They were recorded with that sound and that mindset. So yes, it was okay if you're wanting to do that. But if you wanted to do something else, it just screamed of that sound. I stepped away. Also, I found the same kind of stuff with the um, with the pattern nature of it. At no point did it feel like a real performance, no matter how clean and clear and lovely the recordings were, which they were. Let's walk through the device as it is and its parts and just show how it works. In its own way, it is clever. We've got a couple of layers in here and we'll work through them as much as possible within the layers. You've got overarching presets and inside them patterns. These patterns are there for everything, which we'll come back to later, and then style phrases, which are more patterns. You can choose where they're triggered from in terms of the keyboard. And from that, 
advancing from here to is how we should put together a performance. Now there are a whole pile of presets. Now it looks like a lot, I don't know exactly what number it is, but bear in mind a lot of these aren't going to match what you're looking for. Uh, as I said, with Rockabilly, Rockabilly is a real basic of, well, music, uh, but there isn't one. Um, the presets will change these sound characteristics and change the style phrases. So they're an overall kind of thing. But we do need to be aware that a certain percentage of these are, well, famous songs, all based around famous songs. I can't remember which ones were which, but I remember hearing Donna Summer's I Feel Love. Oh, there you go. That's got to be real hard to use in a piece. Real hard to use. Oh, before you ask, yes, they're all synced to your door. It's just self-evident. Um, amusing, but dangerous. Uh, I remember in one of the other ones, Finding My Girl. And how wise it is, is it to write a song based around such a famous bass line? It may be a simple bass line. It may be like a super obvious fundamental progression, but it seems artless. So please be cautious. Uh, these presets are designed to make you feel like you're getting the thing. This is obviously based around a cool and a gang something or other, but you've got these overall presets. Yes, you may get lucky there. The whole thinking behind this is, would be that you sort of go through and go, oh, okay. And therefore I'm getting my coolest bass line ever. But if that's from a Cool and the Gang song, where are you going with that? With regards to what might happen down the track, I don't know. They may have modified these enough that they're, that they're going to pass the, um, the licensing test. I'm not getting into that argument. I'm merely getting into the broad concept that if we're using slabs of a famous song, we're really pushing ourselves in the wrong direction. Uh, as an example, I got asked to... Uh, uh, give professional feedback on a song and I'm listening to it and within seconds I'm sort of going Ooh, this is just like a clone of famous band X with a, a strong helping of famous band Y and my partner walks in what are you doing oh I'm just listening to this song to give professional feedback oh it sounds just like famous band X the more she listens the more she goes you know it just sounds like famous band X only not quite as good Boom. And that was part of my feedback. It was already part of my feedback. You know, you aren't going to create any mileage for yourself as your own band. If you are having people listen and go, yeah, just sounds like Famous Band X, only not as good. Here, let me go put on my Famous Band X record. You don't want to do this. So please be cautious. But nonetheless, there are these overall presets that change the whole device. We then got the two behaviors, as you've seen. There's the player, where it will play phrase. And then we've got the instrument, where it will just play individual notes. And we'll walk through each of those in turn. The player mode is, as I said, that's the real essence here of the virtual bassist. Here, look, we've got a studio session player who's gonna play perfect bass lines famous bass lines for you. Make of it what you will. There are style presets in the middle here. So there are a whole pile of these. They indicate the BPM at which they were written. Obviously I'm running it a little bit different. So some things will feel rushed. Remember these style presets, the common phrases are the same everywhere. The style phrases will be different. So Donna Summer is there regardless, whereas these will be different. So let's pick the next one. See, different. Still Donna Summer. 
important to understand that. That's what these bits do. They just affect, well, really this. They change this and nothing else. You see all of this stays the same. Still Donna Summer. Well, Georgia Maroda, really, but still the Donna Summer song. And this has changed. This is how this all works. We've got the common phrases, which you can have no phrase playing. And then this progression of phase, phrases. I'm not sure what that does. I didn't RTF it. Pretty common approach, this one. Very Iron Maiden. Now, obviously, these can be triggered from the keyboard as well. So I would need two, two hands. There are a couple of intros, which are commonly the idea is that they go before. And then you've got these fills. You can put together a performance that way. But believe me, this is not how a remotely experienced player will put together a performance. So you're likely to put something together that doesn't flow properly. Um, I mean, you can put it together whatever you want. There are plenty of, uh, of pieces out there that have got some very unusual ways that they're put together, but they flow really, really well because it makes sense. What I, by properly, I don't mean rules. I mean properly meaning that the story just breaks. It's like, um, yeah, we were driving down to the, the shop in the banana. It makes a broken sentence because it makes no sense. Um, maybe if everybody knows we have a yellow car and it's called the banana, then it makes sense. But without that context, spatula, dishwasher, benzene, it's random. So just be very, very careful that you have flow here and not just something that you think sounds funky. They're your common phrases. Remember, they are there on every single one of these. They will be the same. You then have your style phrases, which is C2. And they're versions of intros. And these vary across those style things. And your fills as well. And it's possible then to stop a pattern from playing entirely. But that stop is really the only change that you can make to an existing pattern. There was a pattern in here which was do 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 do. Of course, I hear it and I go, "Oh, it's Gary Newman." My shadow in vain. Except Gary Newman's "My Shadow in Vain" is do 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 do. Do 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 do. Stroll to the cafe, my god, our time flies. Um, but while I could create that by hitting the stop over MIDI at the right time, again, I can't actually say, hmm, I hear this bass line this way, can we change that, Lee? Because this won't change. And that, that makes it easier to use than other 
contenders out there that have far more complex interfaces, and the only way to do more is to have increasingly absurdly complex interfaces, which rely on the user actually really knowing how to play the real instrument in the first place. Um, the more complex they are, the more you need to know how the instrument works, which kind of takes away the whole concept of, hmm, I know there's this thing called a bass. Do you play bass? Yes. Lee, can you come over and play bass for me? Because I don't know about... See, this is how bands worked uh, and how you got what you got. Because the person who showed up, whether it was Leland or somebody else, that was what defined the sound that you got. You know, if Lemmy wandered into the room rather than Leland Sklar, we would end up with a very different kind of sound. Um... Because Lemmy's Lemmy and Leland is not Lemmy. Um, and yay for that fact in both directions because they were both cool bass players in their own way. Um, so, yeah, mm. right, play range. The play range... This is the first thing you've got to come to terms with. An electric bass, a normal electric bass... The low string is an E. Just like on an electric guitar, the low string is an E. Meaning that you can't actually play any note below that E. And you can wait your turn, drop D, people. Now, many things would not give us these keys. And I can see why they've given us these keys. A, to deal with drop D, which we'll get to in a moment. But because what will happen is people go here and then go, I want to go down. And they'll be really shitty that there is no sound coming off those keys. So if we were to say, I'm going to start my piece on E and then move to C, we'd really be doing this. Boom, 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 boom. So they've given us the facility to do it that way. It's not good practice. You would do this. So just understand that while that's the coolest sounding note on the whole instrument, it's not necessarily where you want to be starting it. If you want that to be... is That's going to just define your chord progression. Now we've got a whole show on chord progressions. If you're just playing single notes like that, you're still defining a chord progression. Whether you want to be in chord progressions or not, you're still defining it by default. So your range is really E up through these notes up here, which I assume to be the top playable notes on a normal electric guitar. Before anyone gets too bent out of shape, drop D is not 100% uncommon, especially in metal. That is where you tune your guitar down a tone, meaning that your lowest, your E now becomes D, and it sounds more, sounds richer, sounds a bit more menacing. Don't use drop D unless you really know what you're doing, and that is deliberate. If you just go, oh, but it sounds more cool, you might be creating some difficulties for yourself, especially if that is not within the tuning of the piece. If it's not within the key or scale of your piece, you will have a lot of problems. Which reminds me at this point to remind you, please make sure you keep everything in key and scale. Now, there is a feature for this. We can lock everything into, say, D, which is that one there. It just means that where we have a progression that is melodic, it will keep those notes within the scale that's there. If you don't keep all your notes of your piece in the scale, then they will simply sound out of tune, they will sound a little bit broken, they'll sound a little bit wrong. Um, it's not about ruining your life. You can put any keys together that you want. And that's your business. 
that's not gonna let me do that at once, uh, but this is what you need to do. So use your key and scale and set that if you're using, um, especially if you're using uh, UJAM stuff all the way through for every single part of your piece uh, as your virtual band, <laughs> then make sure they all got the same key scale. Otherwise you will have notes that don't belong comfortably at least. Uh, you can do these when you know what you're doing, but if they don't belong comfortably, it will be unmixable and it will always sound broken and wrong and people who hear it will just go, that's broken. Whether they can tell you why it's broken or not doesn't matter. They'll just go, that's broken and walk away. You don't want to do this. We've also got this button here, which is melodic. Hear how this is playing different notes? Turn that off. And it just becomes the same pattern on the same note. So if you like the pattern, but you don't want the movement, and the movement is a lot of the fun, then you can turn off the melodic side. So that's your how you put things together. You choose your patterns. And that therefore becomes your piece. It's going to take a little bit of time to actually do that in a way that makes any sense at all. Please be very, very careful. You've then got instrument mode, which is where we drop all the pattern stuff and it now becomes a playable instrument. We've still got the same key range, except it stops at E, which is good because there's nothing below it. If you hit drop D, then it gives us those couple more semitones. But again, don't allow drop D unless you are specifically writing in drop D. Otherwise, you'll just end up with weirdness. You might think it's clever, but it'll be weird. Nobody likes weird unless it's deliberate. Um, and just going, oh, but I like the sound of it doesn't make it deliberate. Often you like the sound because it's arresting, because it's broken. Um, and that's okay if you're making it a feature of the piece, but just going, oh, but it sounds cooler, it will just sound fundamentally broken to the average listener. You don't want that. So you've got your range and your high note. That just becomes a... a playable synth per se, based on these bass samples. You've then got a little bit of articulation. And by a little bit, I mean a little bit. There is not a lot compared to the average thing. But again, Ujam's promise here is that this is going to be simple. The only way to be simple is to cut away lots of stuff. Because the more complex, the more articulate your bass player, the more little movements and things that they will have. Listen to a fellow like Mick Khan from Japan and his range of little bits and pieces, that things that he could do. And if we were to listen to, Lost, uh, to Lil and Sklar again across his career and the various things that he's done in various songs, we'd be going, like, how many cool little devices do you know, Lee? And he wouldn't be able to answer the question. He'd go, I've probably forgotten most of them. <laughs> Comb my beard. Uh, so... Just be aware that there is legato. Um, and I couldn't work out what, if anything, it did. I know what legato is, but I think you'd have to RTFM on that. There's also a full stop, meaning that if we have a note going and we want to stop it, Makes a strange situation in the sense that why wouldn't you just let go of it? But it is possible to press this button and make it stop. Um, these are a, an octave below where my current keyboard setup is going. Um, so they're more likely to be used within a door. Um, and then we've got slides, which Oddly, I am not having work. I was using them. You could hear them in the um, um, the art rock 
piece, you could hear the slides, but I did notice a couple of times they didn't work. So... I don't know what the rule is, you RTFM. They are pretty basic. Just slide this way, slide that way from memory. They are... Well, they'll get the job done. That's, that's just all they are, they're basics. You then got dead notes, which will kill a note, which is a different sound from the full stop. So they're various ways of having dead notes. You can tap these with that and they'll have a slight tone but they'll carry the tone of what you are playing if you're playing an actual note. Speaking of, over here we've got a damper. In guitar terms that's generally referred to as muting so we can mute with fat bit of the palm and get the kind of sound. It is also possible to mute with your fretting fingers and by not fretting fully. If you do it wrong, especially with a highly amped guitar, you can just get a scream uh, and uh, some kind of harmonic. But this allows you to... Um, it's a variation in tone. Um, one of the issues that I had with the players was that they played their notes through regardless. And in rockabilly in particular, because it's so fast, if you have a bass player who's playing the whole note the whole way through, you sack them. The, the notes will tend to be played short so that they actually breathe. So if we've got... as our line, an inexperienced bass player might well play it like that and the whole mix will sound muddy and flubby and, well, you sound amateur. A more experienced player might well do... but probably without the, the click on the end of the note because by giving that gap, then everything in the rest of the mix can speak. The actual grooviness of the groove can be grooving rather than being swallowed in the bass players, look how bassy I am, look how long I can hold my note. You can't change that in the player. You can to some extent here, but stopping a note always gives that sound, which is good sometimes, but not good all the time. There is no way to alter that part of the articulation, so articulations are limited, which is a real negative here. Once you get into using this as an instrument, We've then got the character of the instrument. And the character of the instrument can be defined with these presets. It's just saying, okay, we'll move all the knobs to certain places for whatever this sound is. Or you can, of course, control them on your own. There's the pickup position, bridge, and neck. Now, I'm not convinced. Uh, I probably should look this up. Um, my understanding was that bridge was where the strings attached to the body up on this end, the fat end of the bass, and playing there gets you that harder nasal sound. And it's the ace of spades, it's the ace of spades. That's the kind of the, the picking right up here in the lemmy position. It will give you a hard nasal sound. Whereas playing right up here in the middle of the instrument, the middle of the strings will give you a warm, round sound which, depending upon how hard you play it, can give you no sort of clank or, or, or thump on the front at all. It'll just be smooth, 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 which is what the uh, the Royal version is more about in terms of the playing. So I don't know whether these are named backwards or, or merely that I've got it wrong, but they strike me as being backwards, but whatever. One side gives you the warmer tone, the other side gives you the Okay, that's legato. So maybe certain notes together can
Certain notes seem to actually legato, certain don't. It's probably to do with what you could actually legato seeing on one string. You can't legato across two separate strings because there's no connection. So again, that's an RTM FM thing. It does do something, you just need to understand what it is. So your pickup tells you the fundamental tone of what we should be picking up. We've then got character, warm, grand, natural, and brilliant. So they give us between this and these, they give us a fair range of, of timbres. And that's important because a bass isn't this one instrument that always sounds the same. Um, it's not like an 808 bass sample that's always just going to sound like the same boring 808 bass sample. How dare I say that? Uh, a bass is a tremendously versatile instrument and this gives you some range between these two alone. On the other side, we've got some options. Now this knob is upside down. This knob works the way I think it's gonna work. Drag up, the, the pointer goes up, drag down, the pointer goes down. This one, drag up, down, it's it just, it feels like it's backwards. I guess it's technically correct, but every time I go to move it, it's upside down. Sorry, a uh, scam caller trying to tell me that, uh, well, all kinds of stuff wants me to pay to fix a problem that he invented. Good on ya. The amps. We've got DI, direct DI. This is the amp going straight into the desk. Now this is a really beautiful sound and lots of records use either some of the DI or all of the DI. So the direct sound is a thing that should always happen should always be there. If you're sending um, your uh, track off to be mixed, then uh, pretty well every mix engineer will be hoping that you send the bass as a DI um, and also the uh, amp tone. While the amp tone might sound more a combination of some or all of the DI in the mix is, is not at all uncommon. So if you're only going to send the amp sound, make very sure that it really is the best sound ever and the best sound possible for the mix. Otherwise, run one version of that bass line off with the DI and the other with whatever amping sound that you've used. You've got three amp options in this one. Different versions of the plugin have different options for sound. With the direct, there is no drive. It's just literally the samples. Oh, this annoying knob. Cream. Sort of smooth sound. Vintage. Will give you a nice, bright, higher tone, which is not a failing. That's actually a really good thing because it gets that bass up into the listenable area. Remember, most people used to listen to AM radio on a four inch paper cone. Uh, so getting that sound up into the listenable is a really good plan. And then raw, which will drive a bit hard. As to which sound is right, none of them. They're all potentially right. You've got to match them with your piece. And as we've seen, the drive here. Drop D we've covered. There is this octava. Now the octava is an electronic effect. There's such a thing as an octava pedal, a stomp pedal, uh, commonly used by um, electric guitarists who suddenly hear that they seem to be playing uh, twice the width. That's an octava pedal here. A tiny amount of it can be kind of nice in the sense of lifting your presence in the mix, but be careful, too much of it just sounds weird. But they've provided nothing wrong with it being there as long as you are incredibly careful with it. You've got this finisher, which has quite a few presets. Why you'd want it to sound like an 808, I have no idea. You can hear there the lifting quality. Yes, it drops a lot of bass, but gives you a huge amount of cut. Now these are all 
one knob things and occasionally they will be useful. I think the comb filter is very useful if you want to change to sculpt the, the sonic profile. Then the comb filter can be very, very useful for that. That's a um, like a Leslie cabinet, but with one knob, it's it's a bit uncontrollable. Hot bath sounds nice. Exactly what it's doing, I'm not sure. But again, one of the problems I have is that a lot of the sounds are just very well one-dimensional, and that's just because this isn't how a real player would play my piece. Slam compressor. It'll hold the sand for longer. Give you a longer sustain, but sustain's the thing I have a problem with overall here. LP24. Is, it's a preset filter effect, which, I don't know, you'd have to decide whether it gives you any value. Jet plane is a, a flanger. Again, it's such a preset thing. But a little bit of it can be nice. It can help pull your, your bass sound forward. At one stage with the Rockabilly, I was actually using the jet plane to help move it forward until I realized it was creating other problems in the mix. A chorus, which sort of sounds nice, but again, it's just a one knob thing. It's uh, You have no real control over its speed or anything, but it's okay. Um, don't just go straight to doing this because it sounds cool, because a chorus bass can be wonderful in the right place in a mix, Chris Squire. Uh, of yes, um, famous for this sort of thing, but if you get it wrong, your mix engineer won't be able to work with it. Phaser. Again, one knob. Um, delay. I assume that's an eighth. Got no control over it. bit of reverb. Okay. I would be cautious about applying reverb here because you apply reverb here, you should be replying it at the at the mix stage, like the, the, the send reverb for the whole room. If you want to apply a little bit of this and then send the whole thing to the room, fair enough. But if you go applying reverb here, your, your bass is never going to stick to the rest of the mix. Raw two amp room. Maybe it's related to this. It does put some space around it. So some, I would say it's possibly uh, a room mic further back in the room with an amp. Let's go back to that. This one's okay. It's like a very, very mild fuzz type. So if we're playing... It will give a, a kind of a hardness to the sound. Out of all of them, that's probably my favorite. Yeah. So they're there, but please be very careful. These are not a mix engineer's uh, dream. They're a mix engineer's nightmare uh, more often than not. There is a, well, they're calling it an EQ. It'd be more accurate just to call it tone. So let's mix, move over to here. So it's, well, I guess really it's just a tone control. It's like it's, this is pushing forward. It's probably pushing up at about 2K or something. Gives you more cut and detail. And that rolls that away. So you're left just with the deeper part. 
maybe it's an EQ. I almost get the feeling that this is a, a balancing of sounds or something, but however it's done, you've got this balance knob for tone and then a compressor. Again, it's one knob preset compressor that all it seems to do is increase your sustain. It doesn't really work the way I would want any compressor to work. To give you a sense of that, if we look at the, um, the Rockabilly piece, we have this compressor working across the drums and bass. So if we bypass it, put it back in, we hear more groove, less groove, more groove. So the compressor they've got on board just doesn't work the way that I would want a compressor to work in terms of shaping the, the feel of the performance. All it does is flatten things. People want that, fair enough, so be it. That's really your whole range of features across there. That's what the instrument does. You can run it as a in a player mode, in which case you choose a pattern and then let it play, string together various patterns, um, either in real time by pressing keys or over MIDI, uh, and you can say that you've got a bass performance. Um, just please don't fall for the idea that this is the equal of having even a vaguely experienced player actually play your piece and the amount of variety that's in a well-recorded piece. I mean, if you take, say, Guns N' Roses, Sweet Child of Mine, it's a bit of a favourite for bass performance because suddenly um, it's like two-thirds of the way through the song, Duff, apparently, wouldn't surprise me if somebody else was paid to come up with this, do, 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 do. The, the, the bass line turns around. It just reverses itself. And um, kudos to whoever came up with that, but you're not going to find that in here um, because, I mean, it proved me wrong that it's here, but then it's going to be Guns N' Roses pieces. It's not going to be the concept of going, let's give people something that's really going to make them go, Oh, now, most people aren't aware of that change, that turnaround. When I mention it, they go, what are you talking about? But they don't need to, but it's part of why the song works so incredibly well. It's We've got this established groove at the beginning with Axel wiggling his hips, and then suddenly it's like, oh, that's different, and it's super cool. It only runs for a very short amount of time, but these pattern players can't know to do that kind of stuff. The other side is where it opens up into being an instrument that you can play yourself. Uh, with some limited articulation. And then, of course, just whatever your performance, you can change the, the sound, the, the, the texture of the instrument itself a fair amount, but just not as much as a, um, a more dedicated set of tools would do. So you have to be very, very careful, especially if you're not experienced as a mix engineer, that you aren't getting heavy-handed here and just sort of pushing things into nasty. And feeling like that that's gonna be really good because when it comes to actual mixing, it'll never actually sound right, whether it's you or a mix engineer. <laughs> You're just gonna go like, we can't really make this right. It's just gonna sound wrong because everything will be over mixed. But the tools are there, and if you go carefully, they have potential for use, particularly these timbral ones and the amps. They sound okay, but this kind of stuff, I think, possibly does more damage than good. But that doesn't mean from time to time that you might not find something uh, that you go, oh, yeah, that gives me the, a little bit of something that's kind of cool. But again, there's just that feeling that overall, while it sounds okay, it's got a very sort of preset sound. It kind of just always sounds that way, as though whoever's done it says, yep, there's one sound the basses sound like. And they haven't stopped to think that 
is this, could this be Sting? Could this be Lemmy? Could this be Pino Palladino? You know, could it, could it vary as much as a bass really, really does? I hope you have found some interest in this. It does basically cover what it says it's going to do. I have that big reservation that what it's going to do is probably something that shouldn't happen in the first place. Uh, but in terms of saying, yes, we're going to make it simple, yes, it is simple. It very much is simple. They have pared back a lot of the things that you would find on a more dedicated base library, which does make it easier at the cost of ability to do more things. Um, the player, well, again, it's pared back. It will give you results. Is that really the way to get results? I just have to say no, but you have to decide for yourself if that's the bright path for you either now or in the future. Just bear in mind if you go, oh, but it's easy now. I don't know any better right now. It's the only way I can do it now. Are you just simply limiting yourself? So just be careful that if you're choosing the path of like, oh, this will do it for me because I don't know how to do it, that you're probably stopping yourself from actually learning because we largely only learn things when we have to learn how to do them. Uh, and when you have something that gives you the impression that it's doing it for you, then chances are you're just going to use it and not realize what you're missing. If you have any questions, please not about UJAM or the instruments per se. That's a technical support question over to UJAM themselves, but any questions about the content. If you want to get into me about the virtual players thing, please be sure that you have watched this whole video first. Otherwise, if it's clear that you haven't, then we'll most likely we'll probably just delete your comment as being not a real conversation. Go out, whatever you're doing, take your time, and enjoy it. Have a great day.